Well, welcome to 30 Minute Talks, everybody. And once again, thank you for joining us uh, on our weekly show. And thank you for what seems to be a record um, enrollment or a record participation day for some time now. Hi to uh, Perry, Andy, and Gabby. Um, Perry, uh, why don't you say hi to everybody? Well, good afternoon and good morning or good evening to wherever you might be joining us today for another uh, 30 minute talks. Uh, we've been going now for six months, so it's great to have so many students, educators joining us from around the world. So wherever you might be joining us from, again, welcome. And today, uh, looking at uh, realistic and some challenging issues the industry is facing. Alan. Thank you. What about yourself, Andy? Hi, and good to see you again. Yeah, it's good to, good to see everyone again. And as always, uh, we're looking forward to Gabby's talk today because I think one of the things that a lot of industry people are worried about is how do we get our image back? How do we rebrand after a disaster like this? And as we've discussed in some previous sessions where uh, people are going to have to regain that trust and businesses are going to have to build confidence with their customers. So I think this is going to be an interesting presentation and I'm looking forward to it. And thanks again uh, for joining us, uh, Dr. Gabby Walters. Uh, Associate Professor in Tourism. Why don't you say hi to, to our audience today? Hello, everybody, and it's such a joy to be here. So thank you for having me. And I'm really looking forward to sharing my research today. And um, as um, Dr. Andy mentioned before, hopefully giving you some take home tips in how to turn that image around or manage our image and reputation in times of crisis. Fantastic. We're looking forward to that presentation as well, uh, Gabby. And uh, uh, Perry, why don't you mention uh, some of our academic partners? As you said, we've, we're proud to have as many as we do now. Well, as I was saying in, the, in our pre-show discussion, uh, we've built up a, a, a great uh, cohort of academic supporters, and particular our academic partners, who are joining us, such as LPU from the Philippines, uh, to part of Philippines chapter, to my colleagues here at Sunway University in Malaysia, to as far away as the University of the Bahamas, to as high in the world as you can go to Silver Mountain Hotel School in Nepal, to Mahatma Gandhi University in India. So to all of those and to our industry partners such as HOSCO and Tipti, it's great to have your, your support for us. Thanks very much, Perry. And over to you, Andy, with our new academic partner. Yeah, we're very happy to announce our very new academic partner. And this was a special one because this is for the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and it's the Hara College of Hospitality. And it's a, a famous school around the world. Everybody has heard of UNLV. And, and for me, it's actually famous because I graduated from UNLV a long time ago. Even before you see the Mirage Hotel, I was going to school there before the Mirage Hotel was still just an empty lot. And it used to be the, the Silver Slipper and the Castaways and some other hotels that not, some of you have never heard of before. Uh, but those are, are great memories for me and we're happy to have them join as a partner. I was also on the faculty uh, of UNLV for over 20 years and retired from that university a while ago. So it's, uh, it's great to have UNLV. And I know, uh, I, you know, coming from me as a, an alumni and a former faculty member, I know for me telling how they rank in the world uh, as far as hotel schools would, wouldn't be fair because I would have a bias to that. So I think, Perry, Perry, can you tell us what, what does that QS World Rankings actually mean? Well, the, the QS World Rankings started about in 2007. It's, it's done as an institutional basis, but they also have what are called subject rankings. And about five year, four or five years ago, they started doing subject rankings in hospitality and tourism. And UNLV has uh, always done exceptionally well in that, typically coming in at the number one or number two spot. So uh, UNLV has certainly highly regarded. A lot of that comes from their research, but also their reputation from other academics and from the industry. Alan. Fantastic. And once again, thank you to UNLV and all our friends at UNLV for your support of, of 30 Minute Talks. And uh, a, a segment that's proven very, very popular in, in the 30 Minute Talk show, everybody. It's time for another 90 seconds, again, presented by Dr. Andy. Welcome to 90 Seconds. I'm Dr. Andy Nazichuk, and today I'm going to share with you one of my favorite websites. Each week, Joan O'Hay, creator of Sketchplanations, emails one drawing or sketch that explains a different random idea or concept. Today, I'm going to share with you some random sketches so you can see how this works. First, let's learn about the goal gradient effect. It shows when we are closer to a goal, the harder we will work to reach it. If you only need one more stamp on your loyalty card, you become more motivated. How about the Swiss cheese model? I've always understood that it took three or four things to go wrong before something bad happens, 
This sketch is a great way to remember it. Do you notice when you're happy? The quote, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is, reminds us all to appreciate our surroundings. We've talked about time management in previous 90 second videos. This sketch compares manager time versus maker time and allows you to give it some thought. The finish line is there to help you get over the starting line. The Peter Principle is one management theory that I've been familiar with for many years. Seeing how people move up in their careers helps us understand it better. How about the cost of being late? As you can see, it's more costly than you think. And finally, find your why not. We have discussed this topic in the past, but this gives us another way to visualize it. I enjoy receiving my weekly drawings from Sketchplanations and highly recommend that you visit this website, sign up and start receiving a weekly concept that you will allow you to learn something new in a creative way. A special thank you to Joe O'Hay for allowing the use of his sketches for this episode. I'm Dr. Andy Nazarchuk, and know you too will enjoy sketch Sketchplanations. Thank you very much, Dr. Andy. And uh, as usual, a very interesting 90 seconds and, and a very uh, thought-provoking uh, 90 seconds for today. So there's there's a product if uh, our audience don't already use it to think about uh, for, for, for their future um, studies, their own future lives, or, and um, a product that, I guess, comes recommended. And actually, uh, and, uh, comment sorry, out. Andy. It is, uh, it is free. I, f I should have mentioned that in the video. It is free. It's, you know, you don't have to pay anything. So it's something that, you know, it's a great way to just get a free email every week with, a, with an interesting concept or idea. So we love it. Thanks very much, Andy. And um, yes, uh, I think you, you've hit the nail on the head there. I think our students and our faculty uh, love things even more if they are free. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, starting today, today's show, uh, once again, um, Hi to Gabby and welcome to uh, Associate Professor Gabby Bolters. Uh, let, let me give you a 30 minutes welcoming um, segment here, Gabby. Um, Gabby has a substantial background in tourism marketing with an emphasis on consumer psychology. And Gabby has focused much of her research work towards image and reputation management. And in particular, uh, tourism market recovery following crises and disastrous events. She's conducted numerous consultancies and projects with tourism destinations from different parts of the world, seeking to enhance or revitalize their reputations and regain trust among the tourism market as a result of one, of one or more or many critical events. Her recent focus on COVID-19 and travel behavior has produced valuable insight as to what Australia's tourism industry can expect from domestic travelers and how to navigate the way through these uncertain times. And I guess that's a topic that's, that's keen to all of us at the moment. In 2017, uh, Dr. Walters award, was awarded the Centre of Australia's University Tourism and Hospitality Education, which is called the, as we all know it, the Fellows Award, an esteemed accolade that recognises significant cont contributions to the tourism and hospitality field. Today, uh, Gabby is going to be sharing her thoughts and insights on image and reputation management during times of crisis. Welcome, Gabby, and what a fantastic background. Thank you, and thank you very much for having me. Um, I'll share my slides now, shall I? Sure, but before you do, I, I did have a question for you. I know you've just recently sure. produced a book. Why, why don't you show uh, the audience? Have you got a copy of your book there? Oh, I have on the book. Don't, don't let moment. me put you on the spot. Maybe you can share that with us later. <laughs> I think but... it, it, it featured in, in your little um, introduction there. But Fantastic. yes, there is. It's uh, Image and Reputation Management. Congratulations well, on been... that. Thank you very much. And yes, okay. if you'd like to start your presentation, we're all looking forward to it with, with bated breath at the moment. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, um, good afternoon, everybody. And um, thank you again, 30 Minute Talks, for allowing me to come on the show and um, share my research with you. I've been researching in crisis and um, disaster recovery now for around 10 years. And obviously underlying um, crisis and, and disaster recovery is um, bringing back that image and reputation and um, so today I'm just going to share with you um, what I've learnt to date in this space and also a couple of case studies um, that might help you to apply this knowledge um, to your own context. So I'm going to talk briefly firstly around disasters and crises in tourism and um, basically what they mean for the tourism industry. And then I'm going to talk about destination image formation agents. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the media and destination image because 
when it comes to crises and disasters, the media can be our best friend or our worst enemy. And I'm, I'm going to talk to you about um, just the amount of damage that the media can do, but also how we can recover from that. I'm going to talk about how destination images uh, influence travel behaviour, both during and following a crisis. And we need to remember um, in this context that crises and disasters are not just one off. They can be very um, long-standing, and this can uh, lend itself to long-standing image issues. So I'm going to talk to you about a little study that I did on um, the country of Jordan, which is located in the Middle East as well. And then finally, I think we can't go through this kind of presentation without talking about COVID-19. So I'm going to share with you some of the findings of a study that I've done this year. Um, and talk specifically around how we can manage our image and, and reputation during these times. So firstly, when we talk about disasters and, and crises and the tourism industry, basically, uh, in a nutshell, they affect visitation because they affect tourists because these kind of events create great uncertainty. And this uncertainty can be around um, whereabouts in the destination has this crisis or disaster occurred? Um, how accessible is the destination? Can I still go and have a safe holiday at this destination? Can I go and still have a satisfactory experience if I'm to visit this destination? What's open, what's closed? Um, and as you know, Sometimes the information we get around crises and disasters isn't enough to give us a really well-rounded understanding of what's actually happened. For example, I heard that there were some cyclones in the Philippines um, only last week. I could not tell you where, in fact, those cyclones were because all I heard was that there were cyclones in the Philippines. So if I was planning to visit one of the, the islands, I was going to the island of Cebu in the, in the, in the Philippines, I might um, cancel that trip because... I'm not sure if the island of Cebu is actually open for business. This uncertainty obviously influences travel demand and our willingness to travel and our willingness to travel to those destinations that have been impacted. Unfortunately, there's no one size fits all approach to responding to crises. How someone responds to a bushfire or a forest fire is very different to how we respond to a flood or a cyclone event. How we respond to a terrorism event is very different to how we might respond to um, an enduring crisis that has resulted in long-term destination image issues. So we certainly don't know right now enough information to, to, to fully understand how tourists are responding to this pandemic. I know there's a lot of research going out there. And I know in maybe a year or two's time, we'll, uh, based on the amount of research that's being conducted in this space, we will have a good understanding. But right now, we are feeling our way in terms of this pandemic. Understanding how tourists perceive a destination during and following a crisis or disaster is critical to recovery because we need to know what's in their mind. We need to know where we're positioned in their mind and, and how this crisis or disaster um, has changed the way that they're thinking or feeling towards our destination. So let's look at the destination um, image agents, the ones that for the, the things that form the image that we hold towards tourism destinations. So the mainstream media, what we read in the media, what we see in the news, and particularly when it comes to crisis and disasters, greatly influences how we feel and how we think towards a destination. Social media, um, what we read on social media, what we, uh, the posts we read from our friends who are putting their stories and photos up about their experience at a particular destination. These experiences and these comments on social media might be negative or they might be positive. Um, friends and relatives, we might have friends and relatives who live at a destination or who have been to a destination for a holiday and come back and share their stories with us. That will evoke various images in our mind and have a great impact on how we view the destination. Film and television. There's a lot of literature out there that talks about the influence of, of film and television in how we perceive a destination. So um, one of our students here did a case study on Mexico. And Mexico, unfortunately, is um, a filming location for a lot of um, movies that portray 
um, gangs and drugs and, and danger. So people therefore, you know, form an opinion and think, I don't think I want to go to Mexico because there's that fine line between what is real and what is fictitious. Documentaries um, can also shed various destinations in a negative light. Um, film and television obviously can also influence our views towards destinations in a positive light. New Zealand capitalised on its hosting of the Lord of the Rings and has various attractions that have been created um, to reinvent that experience for people. Commercial travel provided, so this is when we openly seek information, this is all the members of our travel trade, our travel agencies, airlines, accommodation providers, destination marketing organisations. So these people are the people that obviously provide the information that we want to um, accumulate when making our decision. And depending on how um, well they provide that information, how well they market the destination, will obviously have some influence on, on how strongly we feel about the destination, how much we want to visit. <coughs> Travel review sites, so user-generated content um, is probably one of the most referred to information sources when it comes to planning our holiday. So we're looking at what other people um, thought of the destination. And, you know, if you read too many negative reviews, then we're probably not going to have a great image of that destination or, or that particular tourism um, attraction. Um, and therefore, that the reputation and the image of that particular destination is going to be tarnished in our minds. Um, First-hand experience. Obviously, whether we visited the destination before, we might have lived at the destination, it's going to influence our, our image of that particular destination. And the more we know, um, the more um, reliable that image is going to be as well. So when it comes to crises and disasters, as I, oops, sorry, wrong button. When it comes to crises and disasters, um, the mainstream media, as I mentioned before, is one of the key um, agents when it comes to our destination image. Social media as well plays, plays a role. And I'm just going to talk you through an example here. Um, of how the mainstream media can, can influence our image. So basically how tourists feel about a destination that's been affected by a disaster is really heavily influenced by the media coverage. And unfortunately, the media can be a culprit in providing misleading information or they're not specific enough about um, where the actual crisis or disaster took place um, in terms of their geographical references made to the event. The media's agenda and framing of disasters is mostly negative. Um, and that in turn affects our, our feelings towards the destination, it affects our emotions. And um, generally those emotions that we feel, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, are, are negative. And the media headlines attract more hits and they attract more attention, unfortunately, when they are negative in nature. The media also like to exaggerate, and we call this sensationalism. The media like to, um, particularly if there's not a lot going on in the world, they like to blow things out of proportion and make us excited and, and attract our attention towards these events, regardless of how large or how small they are. So I'm going to talk about the 2019, 2020 Australian bushfires. Now, you might remember this event it happened at the beginning of this year and it was quite extensive. It happened in Victoria and New South Wales. And um, it was quickly kind of forgotten about, unfortunately, due to the COVID pandemic, but nonetheless, it had a significant impact on our tourism industry. So where they're talking about losses of up to $4.5 billion to the economy. And tourism was just one of the industries that was impacted by this crisis, but, um, it's an important one and it contributes over um, to over 10% of Australia's GDP. So let's look at how this particular disaster was represented overseas. So what we do know about um, media coverage is the further away somebody is from the destination, the more confused they're going to be. And this is why. So let's have a look at this particular map here. This was in the UK media. And this was basically saying those red spots on this map are where the fires are. Now, I know 
and you now know that these fires took place in New South Wales and also parts of Victoria. So down the bottom end of that map, we've got Melbourne, we've got Sydney. So the fires were around those two capital cities, but they didn't affect those capital cities. Now, according to this map, it's very hard to find a location in Australia that isn't actually impacted by the fires. And that was greatly untrue. So people in the UK are like, hmm, well, I was going to go to Australia, but now I think I'll go somewhere else because there's nowhere I can go where there's not a bushfire. If we look at the headline here, bushfires have torn through Australia, devastating much of the country. Again, this is misleading. Now, if you weren't that familiar with Australia, you didn't know anyone in, in Australia who could, you could perhaps confirm this information with, then every tourism operator in all of those regions where those red dots are need to be concerned about their reputation. This was another headline that was presented in the UK media, Australia ablaze. So there we go. Australia's on fire, according to people in the UK. Celebrities are great at drawing attention and awareness to important issues. Unfortunately, when these fires happened, Rihanna, who you might know, in all her good intentions, unfortunately did more damage than good when trying to draw awareness to the Australian bushfires and raise money, actually, and, and, and she was encouraging people to donate to the bushfire appeal. So in sharing this, um, in all her goodwill, she actually did um, uh, some real damage in terms of our... our image and reputation and the betrayal of these particular fires. Her 342,000 likes there basically suggests that 342,000 people in the US think that the whole country is on fire. So this is social media and, and social media travels very quickly as we know. When we look at the headlines, we did a content analysis on the headlines used to depict bushfires in Australia and this is what the words were. Armageddon, Nightmare, D-Day, Heartbreak, Hellfire, um, Inferno, Catastrophic, Mega Bad, Hell. Now, when you're thinking about going on a holiday, do you really want to go somewhere that's associated with these kind of emotive, sensationalised terms? So consequently, our destination image is jeopardised. Tourists are confused. They don't know which part of the country is affected. They don't know um, where they can go and where they can't go. They cancel for the short term. They might cancel in the long term. They might deem the country just not safe in general. They might avoid the country in bushfire season. Um, and this makes them question the safety of a destination. Now, following this pandemic, well-being and health and safety are going to be front and centre of the tourist decision process. It wasn't so much like that in the past, but there were significant um, segments that we call risk averse that may have responded quite badly to, to news of these fires. Destinations um, that are portrayed like this take a lot longer to rebuild and recover because the image and reputational damage is quite extensive. Livelihoods are lost because people who are relying on the tourism industry for their, their income um, may have to close down or may have to go for months on end without the tourist visitation. And basically, we also need to remember that the image and reputation of non-affected destinations are also impacted. So we can't turn a blind eye when these crises happen and go, oh, it's okay because that was in another part of the country. We really need to know um, just how we are implicated in terms of the media reporting. The last consequence is that investment into, um, into marketing campaigns can be, can be wasted. So here's Kylie Minogue, and here she is featured in a destination marketing campaign rolled out by Tourism Australia just before the bushfires hit. This was a multi-million dollar campaign that had to be withdrawn because basically um, her messages in that campaign um, were undeliverable as a result of these bushfires. Very sad. So what can the image do to manage this reputational damage? 
really importantly, we need to closely monitor how the media is portraying the destination. That's just not in your local media. That's in the global media. We need to provide factual information to um, mitigate um, this, the information that has been misleading and assist tourists to make an informed decision. For example, Queensland probably should have been very proactive at the time the media was, was reporting those fires overseas and, and you know, saying to people, Queensland is, parts of Queensland are 2,000 kilometres away from where those fires are taking place. Because remember, people who are in faraway um, locations may not be that familiar with the geographic layout of a, of a destination. They need to provide regular updates as to the recovery process and the status of the destination. And that will help tourists make decisions um, around where they can and can't go, what's accessible and what's not. Sometimes no tourism infrastructure is damaged. Okay, the fires could be um, away from the main tourism precinct. Therefore, the destination is still open for business. And in that case, you continue with marketing activities. If the destination itself is ready, if all the tourism attractions haven't been affected, then it's okay to continue. Some people question that because they think, is this a little bit insensitive to those um, people that are affected and people perhaps that aren't in, in tourism? But our research tells us that um, it's actually okay to go ahead with, with marketing. You need to manage the media and work with the media. There's some destinations in Australia that are particularly prone to bushfires that actually have the media on their recovery and also their preparedness committees. And they're educating the media around the damage of their reporting to the economic well-being of not only the destination, but also the country. We need to work with government to reassure tourists that it's safe to travel. Government advisories are a very trusted information source, particularly around this pandemic. So we need to make sure the government are, are behind the destinations and sending out informative information to domestic and international tourists. Ensure tourists understand that their safety is the destination's number one priority. We don't want to look like we're just up for a money grab and, and you know, being irresponsible and attracting tourists to the destination for economic purposes, but also just making sure that we, we are reminding tourists that we're doing everything we possibly can to make sure they're safe. And then the last um, point I've got here is mitigate this damage or any reputational damage for that matter through strategic marketing messages. And I'm going to show you a project right now about um, how we can do this. Oh, before I do, if anybody wants to read more about sensationalist media reporting, you can in this, uh, in this article, we've, we've done this research and we've written it up. So it's there for you if you wanted to um, download that and learn more. So what about destinations with longstanding image and reputational issues? Let me talk you through a case study on Jordan in the Middle East. So Jordan, particularly around the time of ISIS um, and uh, when there was a lot of political unrest in the, in the Middle East following the Arab Spring, um, Jordan didn't have, I guess, the best geographical location and, and there's nothing we can do to change that. They were very close to Syria. Um, they border with Israel um, and, and Egypt and um, also Saudi Arabia. So when the Arab Spring took place, Jordan was, was very much um, not, it wasn't so much involved, but it was implicated purely because people weren't that familiar with the geographic proximity of, of Jordan and its involvement with, with the political unrest. Jordan's a beautiful country. It's, it's on the Dead Sea. As you can see, someone's floating there reading a book. It has a lot of great tourist attractions, a lot of, um, this is Petra here. Now, Petra is one of our new seven wonders of the world. And Jordan, believe it or not, is very dependent on tourism. A lot of people think Jordan is part of the oil industry, but it's not. It relies heavily on tourism. The only oil that Jordan has is olive oil. Um, this is Wadi Rum. Wadi Rum is another natural wonder. Wadi Rum featured in the movie Lawrence of Arabia. It's a beautiful place. I visited Wadi Rum myself and got my makeup done by one of the very friendly locals there. Actually, that's, um, that's desert earth sand he was painting my face with. And it has some of the most beautiful resorts and hotels in the world. Um, as I said, featured on, on the Dead Sea. So it's a, it's a beautiful coastal destination, much to everybody's surprise. 
Now, Jordan was really struggling um, with their destination image. And because they were so reliant on tourism, it was really important for them to try and overcome this long standing image that wasn't as a result of any particular dramatic event, but it was a, a result of a long standing um, issue surrounding political instability in the region. So what we did, we did a little bit of experiment and we looked at um, seven different messages in terms of their uh, ability to um, manipulate and, and, and strategically um, modify people's image perceptions of Jordan. So down the side there, under the, you'll see all the messages that we tested. Now these messages were informed by the literature and they've been tried and tested in, in various studies before. And then across the top, you'll see a number of destination, destination attributes and um, perceptions. So we have safe, risky, violent, confident, fun and attractive. So these were all the, I guess, the image attributes um, that, that people consider when they're, they're, they're thinking about visiting a destination. So in terms of um, Jordan, we asked the question, so what message is the most effective effective message in order to make people feel safe about visiting Jordan. So as you can see highlighted in yellow there, Jordan, oasis of stability. So using that term oasis, so oasis is an, means an island and it's Jordan is in the middle of those destinations that were experiencing political instability. So it's sort of saying, well, we are, um, might be amongst those destinations, but we are a place that is stable. That message was number one in terms of um, working on perceptions around safety. We wanted to, to reduce people's risk perception. So again, this ad um, was number one when it came to reducing risk perception. So that's the smallest mean you'll see is 3.52. And that was, um, that was uh, people's risk when uh, perception of risk when looking at that particular message. When we um, tested violent, again, we wanted a low mean here so that that particular message was effective in changing people's um, image perceptions around Jordan being a violent place too. So when it came to instilling confidence in people to travel to Jordan, um, this message, 800,000 people already came, join them. So that's almost a herd mentality approach. So saying, look, everyone else is coming to Jordan, so why don't you come? They've all had a fine time and they've left and nothing's happened. So that instilled confidence in people to visit Jordan. Then if we want a destination to look like a fun place, because let's face it, tourism is all about having fun. Um, the message that says Jordan, a great past and a greater future, interestingly spoke to this particular attribute as well. And then finally, when we're wanting to look at the attraction and appeal of a destination, um, the message Jordan so close, yet a world apart, um, really resonated with that particular attribute. So again, Jordan saying, well, yep, we are close perhaps to this instability, but we're also a world apart in that we've got some of the world's leading attractions. One thing you might notice down the bottom there is that 50% discount didn't really score that highly in modifying any of these particular image attributes. Now, I always say that discounting isn't the way to go. And this particular study here demonstrated that because discounting can make people question the quality of something. When you go to a supermarket and you, you see a discount bin, you might pick up something from there. What's the first thing you look at at something that's really discounted is the use by date because straight away you're thinking, oh, that's cheap. Um, there must be something wrong with it. So, we kept looking at Jordan because it was such an interesting case in terms of image. And we looked at image and emotions. Now, image and emotions are highly correlated because how a tourist feels about a destination will have a significant impact on their image perception. Common emotions that arise as a result of crises and disasters or long-term instability are generally fear, anger, and sadness, and they're all negative. But what if these impacted destinations were able to induce positive emotions? Now I've got a little cute little puppy dog there that I'm hoping will make you all feel a little bit warm and fuzzy and, um, and induce those, those positive emotions there. So we actually did a study still using Jordan as the context and we looked at the ability of um, 
at induced emotions in reducing risk perceptions. So we thought if we can make people feel really good and warm and fuzzy and happy towards a destination that um, may have long-standing image issues, will that reduce the risk? And guess what? We did find that it does. So the study demonstrated the power of an ad-induced emotion. So the, the, the ad we used was this beautiful um, portray, video portraying Jordan. It had very peaceful music. It had beautiful scenery and friendly faces. Um, so this ad-induced emotion was successful in lowering risk perceptions. And we also found that not only did it reduce risk perceptions, it also increased people's willingness to travel. So there's some evidence there around the, the power and of the relationship between um, image perceptions and emotion. So I promised you that I would talk about COVID-19 and what this means for destination image and reputation management. So again, moving back to our emotions, my research has found, and I'm sure everyone's research is gonna find this, that consumers are scared and worried and very uncertain about traveling amidst this pandemic. Health and well-being, as I mentioned before, will, will be and front and center of the tourist decision process. Destination image in the case of COVID is going to be very much built on trust and risk perception. Destinations that have managed this pandemic effectively and are perceived as doing so will be highly regarded. So they're the, going to be the winners in terms of um, upholding the reputation um, for safety, health and well-being. The tourism industry need to ensure they are perceived as doing the right thing by both visitors and their host communities because host communities are big stakeholders in tourism. And we need to reflect on the fact that not all host communities are going to be ready to welcome an influx of tourists. We've been in lockdown, we've been isolated, um, we've been sent this message for months on end that we need to sort of keep ourselves away from others. And when you think about um, tourists visiting, particularly regional destinations um, and lots of them, the, the host community may feel a little bit overwhelmed. So we really need to, to protect our local communities, but also protect our visitors. Um, so we need to allow for physical distancing. We need to make sure we're not um, uh, putting lots of people in small spaces and, and, and really managing our crowds and focusing on visitor dispersion and um, making sure that any attraction, any accommodation facility, any restaurant is doing the right thing in terms of maintaining the, the, the right distance. Fair and honest cancellation policies. This is, again, a trust issue. So... People are very gun shy now about booking too far in advance. Um, there's a lot of people that have got money tied up in airlines and big international travel agencies who are keeping their money uh, in the form of a credit rather than refunding people. Some of those organisations are going into liquidation and people are losing money. So that's going to make them care a lot more about refund and cancellation policies. So you need to be fair and reasonable with those. Honesty and open regarding the status of the destination. So um, make sure that you're not promising something that you can't deliver. And if, you know, some of the, the, the businesses have unfortunately had to close their doors and the experience isn't going to be what it used to be, then you need to be open and honest about that. Um, acknowledging yet being seen to mitigate the risk of contracting coronavirus. Like I mentioned before, it's really important to um, acknowledge that there is a risk. Um, it's no point sweeping it under the rug because people know that there's a risk. They know um, that no destination is exempt from pa the pandemic. So it's um, instead of going, oh, pandemic, what pandemic? We're safe, you know, come along, nothing's going to happen. It's more around saying, yep, we know there's a risk, but we're doing everything in our power to minimise that. Think about getting on an aeroplane. What's the first thing they do in the unlikely em event of an emergency? Here's what you do right? You don't see people jumping up and running for the door. People accept the risk. The airline has acknowledged the risk, but are then presenting strategies on what they're going to do to keep you safe. 
making sure visitor health and well-being are seen as the number one priority, like I mentioned before, and balancing that compliance with visitor satisfaction is going to be the hardest thing for the industry because people are fed up with COVID-19. People associate holidays with escaping. And I think it's going to be, it's going to be a time where people are fed up with um, having the pandemic in their faces, but we cannot get complacent, but we also need to work out a way how we can still offer a really satisfactory to and rewarding tourism experience while at the same time remaining compliant with COVID-19 regulations until of course we find a vaccine. So that is all from me today. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm sorry I have gone a little bit over time, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions um, or receive any feedback you might have regarding my presentation. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Gabby. Uh, wow, what a lot of um, very interesting research and very interesting thoughts that you, you, you've got there. Um, and certainly I've been watching the comments come through. There's some very interesting questions that have been posted. Um, but once again, I just want to acknowledge the number of participants we've got for today's show. I think a record for some time now, so it looks like a significant number of students and faculty are watching us. I'm not sure how many on YouTube yet. I haven't gone through to that, but we know that we've got more than uh, at least more than 500, but we're probably closer to 700 that, uh, as per the registration. So you've, you've definitely uh, managed to get, uh, you know, get the uh, thought juices flowing uh, for, for want of a better word. Great. I hope I've, I hope I've delivered. Um, 30 minutes is a long time to present uh, 10 years of research. I can tell you that. So <laughs> I hope I chose um, the most interesting, uh, interesting uh, finding. Hey, Gabby, you mentioned social media, which, which is these days, everything is social media. Anybody can say anything about anyone. And you have all of these uh, Yelp and all these different kinds of platforms that allow people to provide their comments. What do you do when, when someone says something that is so untrue or so nasty about a destination? How, do you, how can you correct it? What, do you, what, what does a tourist destination do? Um, I think that's a really important point. And I think it's um, one, um, tourism destinations, operators, um, all stakeholders for that matter, it, have a responsibility to monitor social media. And I think, look, Social media is, is bad in that respect, but it's also really um, good in that it's a very um, cost-effective way to um, mitigate any of those negative comments. And I think the worst thing you can do is, is like deny, you know, or, or um, refute strongly the comment that that person made because that is their opinion and they're entitled to it. However, I think there are, are ways that you can mitigate the impact of that by firstly acknowledging um, that, you know, they did have a bad experience, but then, you know, uh, trying to counter that, that message through a message that talks about examples of people having positive experiences, for example, and, well, there might've been something that occurred on that particular day that resulted in that particular incident. So there's an opportunity there for people to, to say, yep, well, unfortunately, the day you came, there was a massive thunderstorm. So, you know, um, for the safety of our, our guests, um, yep, 60% of the rides were closed. You know, it's that kind of um, just bringing in some facts and making it easier for whoever's reading those comments to understand the context in which it occurred. Absolutely. Perry, um, I know there's a, a couple of questions. I think we should pick up a question from our audience. Yeah. First. What about yeah, yourself? I just, I was just, yeah, I was just looking at those. But I think that the, the, the initial point Gary was making was, was really important. That so sadly, I think, because people's geography isn't so good these days. Uh, and my mother was a geography teacher, I should explain. So I, I think I'm a reasonably good geography. But most uh, people these days are not taught geography at school anymore. So when we talk about a country, People don't realize just how many islands, for example, that the Philippines has, or how big Australia is. Uh, well, after I moved to Australia from the UK, I had family calling up saying, oh, we, we, we heard this bushfires, are you okay? Yeah. I said, yeah, yeah, it's, it's in Western Australia. It's a, a five hour flight away. It's a bit like me calling you and asking you, I heard about a road accident in Moscow, and are you worried in London about what's happened? You know. So yeah. this becomes a problem, is that we've got bad sense of geography. The media needs, on a 24-hour news cycle, needs news. So just as the media can be your friend, it can also be your worst enemy in, in, in that case. And I think tourism 
has really struggled to work out how to deal with this. So, the, in, and in, particularly in a, in a situation like we've got with COVID, you know, daily numbers are being produced up there. You, you'd think that the world has absolutely stopped. The reality is very different. There are many countries uh, and locations and territories where things are just fine at the moment. Um, uh, we've got students here from, from Vietnam. Life is pretty much normal there as it is in Taiwan. Uh, the casinos are reopening up in Macau. Yes, there's problems in other parts of the world, but you're not hearing the good bits of the story. All we hear is again, the negative, negative, negative. And I think that's the challenge now. And COVID is gonna be really problematic for us because parts of the world are gonna be locked down and parts are going to be totally opened up. We, we heard today about what's happening in Melbourne and people were queuing up at midnight to get into a bar or a shop or whatever to get in. So it's very frustrating. So people can keep well away from destinations where there's any hint there may be COVID. And I think the point that, that Gav's made, you know, we've really got to get the message out where things are okay and be honest about what the situation is. But clearly that's going to be a challenging because it demands a granular message, messaging uh, and not the, there's no clear black and white necessarily that may some destinations can get out there, others can, where their, their situation is under control. So I think for our industry, this is going to be a, a really problematic period over the next uh, year or, or, or potentially longer, depending how this vaccine is deployed. And, and, um, you know, Gabby, we have a question from uh, uh, Christina Aquino, one of, our, one of our big supporters. What's the biggest destination image predictor? Does it vary from enterprise or geographic location? So what, you know, your chart was very interesting about the security, risk, fun. So what, what, what do you think the most important image predictor is what, for a destination? Um, well, it's actually uh, image predictor. I'm... I'm um, um, Let me ask you. When we talk about attributes, like when we talk about um, what people pay most attention to, right. um, it greatly depends. Like at the moment, it would be how many COVID cases there are. It would be how well a destination has managed COVID. And that is probably what everyone is thinking when they're, when they're choosing a destination. If you asked me that question last year, I would have said, well, it greatly depends on what people are looking for in a holiday, right? So you're looking for a destination that matches um, your um, what it is you're looking for in a holiday and what it is what's, what's motivating you to take a holiday. So if you're wanting to relax, then you're probably looking for an image that betrays, that, that matches that, that particular need. And that's all around positioning. Yeah. You know, you, you mentioned words. If I said F for COVID, is it better to promote that you're a safe destination or a clean destination or one that follows the procedures? Which, which one do you think would have the best impact on your tourists? I think, um, I, I, I think safe destination is going to be questioned. I, I think, um, yeah, I, I, that's a good question, actually. But I think... Um, COVID cases is going to be a big determinant. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and I think this is, this is, this is quite challenging. And it was quite interesting. I posted into the chat. Uh, I said, what messages will get you traveling again? Which destination did you pick? What information, messages, images would you would get you and your families traveling again? And, and interesting, uh, Navira Trezo, if I pronounce that, sorry, it's quite small on the screen here, said, you know, maybe if it's assured, and again, this comes back to this, this concept of assurance and the numbers can tell a story, but they don't tell us the whole story. So in Malaysia, yes, our, our COVID numbers have gone up. They're, they're below a thousand or around about a thousand mark a day. The majority of them are in one particular state, the state of Sabah at the moment. Now that doesn't mean the rest of Malaysia is not okay. And this will be, I think, the challenge going forward. What are we talking about? We talk about a destination. Is it a country? Is it a state or province? Yeah. Is it a town? Is it a village? It's the place you're going to. Exactly. And of course, these become the, you know, the challenges going forward. And obviously, as other destinations pick up on that and people become more wary or hear news. So this morning, I just got the news that my, 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 my own nephew was, has just been diagnosed with COVID and he's currently in quarantine at his university in the UK. 
So, you know, you, you suddenly get that information, you're going, wow, this has really brought it much closer to home. This is a little bit more challenging. Luckily, it seems to be just fine. But the challenge is going to be as these messages roll out, how we get that uh, to, to get those messages about things being um, being okay. And whilst uh, 30 minutes was going on, I actually saw an email that came in from Grab and their message was, you're protected when you come with us. Now, Grab is the premier sort of uh, service. You know, their, their, their little slogan there was showing hand sanitizer. You know, in other words, don't worry. Even though we, you know you've got to travel, we will make sure we take care of you. And I think those will probably be some of the uh, messages that we'll probably see coming out. I think protection is a good word, Perry. I think protection is better than safe. Because safe, yeah. I don't think anyone can guarantee safe. But protection yeah. is, um, is saying, you know, we're doing everything we can to keep you protected. We can't guarantee you're not going to get that. Whereas safety, I don't think people will trust. Oh, I think the point you made about airlines is just bang on. People know there's a risk when flying. Planes crash. Yep. Uh, and they have done for, ever since the first one took up to the air. But it's, it's feeling that. And I was uh, taking a domestic holiday here in Malaysia. And we all got our uh, little safety mask here. And we got our uh, immunity support. Uh, uh, support booster pill here as well. So again, it's not saying it's going to be 100% safe, but it's like we're here to protect you, and we and we care, and it's 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 tangibilizing that message. Anyone can stand there and say we care. It's about doing something and tangibilizing that. I think it becomes so important. No, I totally agree, and I, I just think that um, it's it's a risk that everyone shares and acknowledges, and I think people's expectations are going to be. Um, you know, a lot more realistic. But governments are going to play a key role. The amount of trust we've drained people have in our government at the moment is unprecedented. People are really trusting our government. I think my survey said 93% trust the government to be their number one information source. So governments are going to play a significant role, I think, in, um, in, in managing people's concerns. Yeah, I think there's a really interesting question in relation to that. So let's maybe just take this last question because we are getting close to running out of time, everybody. But uh, speaking about governments and their role in this whole picture is how can we be sure that a private destination is really working with the government and is it really necessary? Can it be like a standard to say that we are safe to go if this private destination is working with the government? So I guess they're talking about if the government and a private destination is working together, that partnership, and they're saying that it's safe, can consumers really th believe that it would be safe? Um, I think that's where accreditation could play a role. So mm. a, some kind of global accreditation scheme. Um, and I would expect that something like that's going to be rolled out. Um, yeah. So that would uh, be the only way to kind of manage that inconsistency and, um, you know, um, around the messaging. And Absolutely. I don't think there's any silver bullet in this, and, and, I, and I think that's clear from just the extent of our own conversation, let alone the, the number of comments. You've absolutely started a, 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 a wildfire going, yeah, because wow. the, the comments are coming through. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of comments, a lot of questions coming in here. I think we go, we're going to have to revisit this topic. We've got a lot here. I, I think it's a topic that we're going to need to revisit, Perry. You're exactly <laughs> right. But, um, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. And today's been a, a fantastic show, uh, Gabby. So listen, can I just ask all of our uh, participants and panelists to thank Gabby, a, a fantastic virtual thank you for your, your <laughs> very interesting and very informative thank presentation. Thank you very much for having me and uh, thank you for joining us and i'll just quickly go back to sharing my screen uh, perry if you've got any other comments that you'd like to make just in relation to questions well no i'd just like to thank everyone for those questions i'm sorry that we you know we try and keep 30 minutes uh presenters on 30 minutes to their 30 minutes um and but this week we've really got uh, so many excellent questions and comments in the chat and all, all over the place so Thank you very much for those because this is clearly a very thought provoking topic. It's a topic that's gonna to make, make a lot of difference and matters to the industry, to you as students, because obviously this is the industry you're looking to go into. So I think this is something we're gonna end up having to, to revisit in the near future. Alan. Thanks very much, Perry. Absolutely couldn't uh, agree more. And um, um, I, I've once again, uh, just like to comment on the, the number of participants and number of re registrations that we've got today. Uh, any thoughts on that, Andy, just before we move into thanking our academic partners? 
Yeah, actually, just a note though, we, we, we actually sold out of our 500 seats in uh, our, our webinar today, but it automatically goes to, to YouTube. So if you come in the future and, and it's sold out again, which we expect it to be, uh, don't forget that we're, we're showing the program live on YouTube and a lot of people will visit that. Uh, and again, it's because of that, we appreciate our academic partners, all, all the schools that support us, uh, PATA, APAC Cree, uh, HOSCO, actually the International Center of Excellence is having their IPOE, International Panel of Experts Conference right now. So thank you to all of our academic partners. Absolutely. Thanks very much. And, and as Andy said, uh, we, we couldn't do the show without you. Thank you very much, everybody. Perry, why don't you talk to us about next week's show? Well, yes. Uh, yeah, I've got to quickly do that because I've got to actually now click that button and then zoom literally straight off to the International Panel of Experts Forum, which I'm speaking at in a moment. But look, before I do that, uh, looking forward to next week because we have got um, a, a guest speaker who's going to look at the issues of a, developing a gastronomic destination the challenges of the future. Uh, Dr. Frederick Bouchon is a former colleague of mine and uh, Andy's. Uh, we used to work with him at Taylor's University here in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. He is now back at the world famous Institut Paul Bocuse, which is in Lyon in France. So it's gonna be a very early morning wake up for him to join us uh, in uh, next week. And he's gonna be looking at the, the issues of developing fine dining and food, and particularly in this crisis. And as I was just saying, you know, the first thing people were looking at doing at midnight in, in Melbourne was going out to a restaurant. There were lines last night to get into a restaurant. So uh, I think one of the big challenges that COVID has brought us has been missing eating out. Uh, and I think the food side of things will probably bounce back the restaurants faster than probably travel and tourism because it's something people can do in their locality. And so we're looking forward to having Frederick joining us next week, Alan. Thank you very much, Perry, and absolutely, we look forward to that show. And once again, everybody, um, don't forget that if you're looking to uh, get one of your certificate of attendance for this week's 30-minute talks, scan the QR code right now. It's available there. Don't forget that if you participate in the survey, we require you to uh, tell us at least three takeaways or three learnings from today's session. We do look at those. We're very interested in your responses, and that enables you to qualify for a certificate of attendance. And on that note, uh, everybody, um, the QR code remains on the, uh, the screen, sorry. It gives you an opportunity to scan that. Um, let's say goodbye. Uh, let's start with yourself, uh, Gabby. Just a last word from yourself. Yeah, look, thank you very much again for having me and, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, and I hope that, um, you know, your destinations um, finally start to settle down and, and this whole pandemic starts to... Uh, settle down at some point but in the meantime I wish you all the best and stay safe and stay well and thank you very much for joining us as well today thank you for the uh, once again for that presentation Andy yeah thank you thank you to everyone we had a great crowd today great topic and I think it's important for us to all look forward to the future because we have to look forward to a bright future in our business and, and I think we can we can use some of the things we learned today to help that may become a reality absolutely Perry well, I'd like to thank Gabby. Uh, she and I work very closely on the Journal of Vacation Marketing. So again, thanks, uh, Gabby, very much for joining us this week, sharing your expertise. Uh, clearly, this is a topic we're going to have to come back and visit again. And uh, uh, hopefully, we'll bring in uh, some, a range of other experts. Uh, you know, each week, we try and focus on relevant, timely, and challenging topics. And so again, Gabby, thank you very much for doing this this week. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you once again, everybody. And uh, as we try and keep the show to 45 minutes, we're slightly over time. But as we said, the, the, the session has been a very interesting, very informative and very pro pro provocative session today. Thank you for joining us. Keep safe, everybody. And until next week, thank you for joining 30 Minute Talks. Goodbye, everybody.